get started. Um, I'm Gigi Barnhill, president of the Board of Trustees of the Amherst Historical Society. And thank you all for coming to yet another History Bite. We're coming to the end of the fall season. And I want to thank George, as I probably don't do often enough, for arranging all of these talks. Today we're delighted to host local author Elena Palladino, who lives in Ware, the other side of Belchertown, I guess. <laughs> when Elena moved to Ware in 2015, she learned of her home's history and its original owner, Marion Andrew Smith, who had been one of the wealthy gentry of Enfield. This personal connection led her to her book, Lost Towns of the Swift River Valley, with its emphasis on the personalities and the people who were affected by the flooding of four towns. She begins with the history of Boston's expanding search for clean drinking water, and we heard Catherine Parent talk about Wachusett Reservoir back in September, and the Wachusett Reservoir really preceded Wabin, was a lot smaller, but of course closer to Boston. And after the general history today, uh, Elena will talk about specific people and how they were affected. The country doctor, the postmaster, general storekeeper, and the factory owner. So please welcome our speaker today. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here today. My name is Elaine Palladino, and I'm here to talk to you about my book, Lost Towns of the Swift River Valley. So I like to start by just sharing some facts about the Quabbin because they are pretty amazing. Uh, so the Quabbin has a capacity of 412 billion gallons of water. It's nearly 20 miles long, north to south, and the watershed covers an area of 120,000 acres. And it serves more than 3 million people in approximately, well, in over 40 towns, mostly in eastern Massachusetts. But there are three towns in western Mass that get Quabbin water. That's Wilbraham, Chicopee, and a part of South Hadley. The Quabbin was built from the late 1920s to the late 1930s, and it was Boston's last stop on its westward journey to uh, acquire an adequate clean water supply for its growing population. Um, in April of 1938, four towns, uh, four Massachusetts towns were disincorporated. They comprised the Swift River Valley, and they were Enfield, Dana, Greenwich, and Prescott, Massachusetts. Um, and in order to fill the reservoir, a lot of things had to happen. All of the bodies buried in valley cemeteries had to be exhumed and moved. All of the structures that were located in the valley were either relocated or were raised and burned. All of the brush was cut to the ground and removed or burned, brush and trees. And the val so the valley was completely empty um, when it began to fill with the waters of the Swift River. It began to fill in 1939, and it was completely full by 1946. So it took nearly seven years for it to be full from the Swift River and also from precipitation. And um, the engineers also built two uncommon structures in the southern part of the valley, which today is the Ware Belcher Town area. That's the Windsor Dam and the Goodnow Dyke, which are located in the Quagga Park. So my book tells the story of the Swift River Valley and the Quabbin through the stories of three individuals who were affected by the reservoir. Um, and I'm going to share more about what's in the book, but I'm actually going to begin by telling you that more personal story of how I came to write this book. So the story starts um, eight years ago now, in 2015, when my family and I moved from Framingham to where um, we my husband, Matt, and I were looking for a house, and we both came across this beautiful colonial revival in Ware separately online. We visited it several times. He really had to convince me to go for it because it's a little overwhelming in size, especially compared to the house we lived in in Framingham. Uh, but we decided to go for it. And it was only after we bought it and after we moved in that we started to hear our neighbors calling it the Quabbin House. So we were familiar with the history of the Quabbin a little bit, having both grown up in Massachusetts, but um, we, we didn't know why people were calling it that. So the rumor on our street was that the house was moved fully intact from one of the Quabbin towns. We knew the house was completed in 1939, 
So we thought that there might be a connection to the reservoir, which was, you know, the towns were disincorporated in 1938. But we doubted very much that this big house was moved in full. So we started to just do some research to find out more. And we were very lucky that a previous owner had started some research and had shared uh, the name of the woman who built the house with, with them, uh, with our immediate neighbors. So we knew that the woman who built our house was named Mary Andrew Smith, and that was a very helpful place to start. So with that information, I started to just look around on the internet, of course, a good place to start. And there's plenty to find about the Quabbin, but not a lot about Marion. Um, so my husband bought this book for me, Quabbin the Lost Valley. It was written by this man, Donald Howe, who grew up in Enfield um, and later moved to Ware. He was a businessman and also uh, later owned a radio station. And in the late 40s, early 50s, um, after the Quabbin was you know, as the problem was um, being filled, he put out a call on his radio station to the former residents of the valley and asked them to share with him their photos and memories and stories of the valley so that he could compile them in a book to preserve the memories and the genealogy of the area. So, um, <coughs> it's still a really amazing resource for people interested in the problem. It's over 600 pages. It has lots about family histories and um, interesting anecdotes and stories. And so I was very hopeful that Marion might be in this book a few times. We would learn a little bit more about her and her family. And we were just um, amazed and delighted to actually find that she and her family members were featured throughout the book. And that's because she um, came from a very prominent family in Enfield. So um, her family owned the Swift River Manufacturing Company, which was located in Enfield actually in a village of Enfield called Smith's Village, named for the family. Her father and uncle ran this mill for many years, uh, and then later her two brothers did. They sold it in 1912, so before the reservoir came to pass. Um, and her, the men in her family were very involved in um, local politics and uh, organizations, and I was uh, very interested to learn that Marion and her mother, Lorraine, were also very involved in the community. They were among the first women to lead the Library Association. They were very active in their congregational church. And they also founded a women's club called the Quabbin Club, which was part of the Federation of Women's Clubs that were um, you know, coming, uh, coming into being at that time. And uh, that club was very important to the valley, which was a more rural area. And it was seen as a social and cultural um, an important group. They brought speakers in from outside of the valley, talked about the important topics of the day, and that club existed right up until the towns were disincorporated in 1938. We also, um, in this book, found uh, photos of Marion's family home. This is their uh, 1896 Victorian that they called Bonnie View. By most accounts, it's the, probably the largest house that existed in the valley, or uh, one of the largest. Um, and before living in this home, the family lived in a different home on the same land in that Smith's Village area. So separate from this research on Marion, my husband was able to contact the builder of our house in Ware, which was still in existence. It's H.P. Cummings, which was based in Ware for a long time. And they still had the contract with Marion to build our home. Wow. And so from that, we were able to understand exactly what came from the quadrant. And so it turns out that Marion took pieces of this house. It was the floors, the doors, the trim, and the grand staircase, and had before this home was demolished. And she had them built into her new house somewhere in 1938-39. So that solved a mystery for us, and it was sort of an exciting discovery. Um, and we really enjoyed learning more about Marion, but uh, didn't do much research for, for a while. But then in the fall of 2018, someone dropped this envelope in our mailbox. <laughs> and we still don't know who it, um, it just had two photos of our house in it from around the time it was built. Uh, no postmark or, or return address or anything like that. And I love, love a good mystery, and so, and I had more time to do more research. I felt like this was a sign to sort of keep going and find out more about Marion and the house. So. Um, this, this got me to keep researching. So uh, 
here are some items from, from my research. So the first place I visited was the Swift River Valley Historical Society, which is up in New Salem, Massachusetts. They have a lot of um, artifacts. They have, there's a house museum that's open seasonally. They have a lot of artifacts from the towns. They also have a lot of papers and photos. Um, so they have all of the Quaggan Club's records. And it, they, they, they're bound in these really beautiful books. And they published the, um, the, the itinerary for their year annually. And, so, um, and of course, the minutes were there, too. And uh, Mary and her mother were featured in a lot of those. Um, I also visited UMass um, because they have a special collection on the Quabbin Towns. The Quabbin Visitor Center in Belchertown has all of the Valley's vital records, cemetery records, engineering records, and, and you can um, see those. I visited the probate court in Northampton to see Marion's very lengthy will and estate, which was pretty fascinating. Um, and she was very wealthy, and when she passed away, she was the last in her family. Uh, and so she was very generous with individuals and local organizations. So that was um, a fun read. And I work at Smith College, and so on a whim, um, I visited the college archives because I had read that Marion's cousin had, had gone to Smith. And so uh, I was able to find her photo. Um, her name was Margaret Lovejoy Butters. And also in the alumni, um, Club records, there were letters she had written from Enfield, um, from, from Marion's house in Enfield. So just these little bits of history that you know were so exciting for me to find. So I began to learn more about Marion and who she was and what she stood for. And um, I really began to focus on what was a central question for me, which was what, what did it feel like for her to have to leave? I felt a very personal connection for her, with her, living in her home. Um, and I was curious to find out how she felt, if, if I could discern that at all. And so her story offered the, um, the perspective of an older resident, she was in her 70s at the time that she had to leave, and um, you know, from a family who had lived in the valley for generations. Uh, <clears throat> sadly, I think I just mentioned this, her mother and her brothers died in the decade that the reservoir was being built. She was never married or had any children, um, nor did her two brothers. So she was truly the last in this important family. And so she had to leave alone. And um, I think, I thought that because she had more education and resources than most people in the Valley, that um, maybe I would find some really obvious evidence of her feelings about the reservoir. And I didn't find that exactly, but I did find that she resisted uh, the reservoir in small ways. Um, so the first was that she refused to be buried in Quabbin Park Cemetery. This was a state-sponsored cemetery that is um, located on Route 9 and Ware. And it was created so that folks who lived in the valley or who had relatives buried in the valley could move um, their relatives or be buried there for free. Um, and most people who lived in the valley couldn't afford to take any other option, but, but Marion could. And um, so she decided that she and her family would be buried in Springfield Cemetery, and they paid quite a bit of money to make that. She paid quite a bit of money to make that happen. But not only that, she actually went a step further, and even though the reservoir was clearly being built, and she actually served on a cemetery commission in Enfield in the 30s, when her mother and two brothers passed, she had them buried in Enfield, even though she knew within just a few short years she would have to have them exhumed in Elsewhere. And I thought that was a really interesting decision, maybe an act of defiance, maybe she just hadn't made a decision at that point as to where else she would like to have them moved, but, um, but a, an interesting uh, decision nonetheless. She also was one of the very last people to leave Enfield in the summer of 1938. Initially the state had said that um, everyone should leave in April when those towns were disincorporated. Later, they changed that and allowed the children who were in those towns to finish out their school years. So they changed the, the absolute last day to July 1st. Um, many people left in the years before uh, 1938. And there were very few people who stayed until the end. And I think it must have been a, diff a difficult decision to stay until the end because Marion and those who stayed would have watched the town 
be completely changed. Um, you know, everything around her home was likely being destroyed, trees were being cut down, the brush was cut down, so probably it was quite unrecognizable by the time she left in the summer of 1930. And she never sold to the state. So um, many people did, they either sold and left, or they sold to the state and then they rented their homes back for a period of time while they decided where they might go. Um, Marion never did sell. Her home and land were taken by eminent domain. Of course, later she did settle with the state, she did get paid, but she never willingly sold. And so that, of course, speaks volumes. Um, and then uh, I learned that Marion died in 1944, so not long after having built this new house in Ware. So in my research, I learned something else about her, too. Um, and though her mother and two brothers passed away in those 10 years the property was being built, I learned that she had another family living with her. So this photo on the left is the Tryon family, Delia and Earl, and they were Marion's housekeeper and chauffeur, and they were married. They lived and worked with the Smith family, worked for the Smith family for many, many years. In 1930, they had a daughter who they named Marion, mm -hmm. after Marion, and the little Marion called the older Marion, you can see them on the right there, um, called her Nana. Mm -hmm. And so this was a very close relationship, and I think uh, it must have been meaningful for Marion Smith to have this family with her. And in fact, the house and where was really built and designed with them in mind. Um, they had a whole, not just sort of like the upstairs quarters of the house, but they actually had a whole side of the house uh, that they lived in. And so it, clear, it was pretty clear that Mary cared a lot about them. In my research, I found this photo of Mary and Marion. This was taken the night of the farewell ball in April 1938, and it was on the front page of the Springfield Republican. And the caption of this photo said something like, um, now that these two... Uh, you know, well, now that the towns no longer exist, these two will no longer enjoy daily meetings or something like that, which actually wasn't true because they were going to move together. But I think that the photo and that caption really capture how the, the sense of this loss of community for the people who lived in these towns that, you know, people they had lived with, in Marion's case, for her whole life, well, both Marion's cases for their whole lives, now they, um, they wouldn't be near them anymore, depending on where they decided to live. So I became really intrigued to learn more about Marion Tryon, the number Marion, knowing she was born in 1938, I thought maybe she might still be alive. So I found, again, turned to the internet, found someone I thought might be her, and um, found an, an, an address. So I wrote her a letter, I printed this photo with it, and explained who I was and where I lived, and said um, how much I would love to speak with her if she were interested in, in talking to me. And about a week later, she called me, oh. and she was still, still alive in her late 80s, living in the Murfields, in the same home that her family moved to when Marion Smith died, so she had been there for decades. Um, and she was just wonderful, shared so much of her memories with me, um, really uh, personalized Marion Smith for me. You know, there was a lot to find about Marion in my research, but it was mostly um, you know, in the minutes of meetings and things like that, and so she was able to really share uh, what Mary was like as a person, and um, that was really wonderful. So, as a personal aside, this is my second daughter in the photo with us, and her name is Marion. <laughs> <laughs> and I named her that, knowing Mary Smith's name, but I hadn't started my research yet, and I didn't even know that this Marion existed. So my Marion is the third Marion to live in our house. So I'll just share, oh, and so I, I forgot, I added this slide. So we also visited Mary and Smith's grave in Springfield together because she had never gotten to do that for some personal reasons. So you can see, uh, you know, from the cemetery card uh, how it was marked that uh, the remains were reinterred from the Quadrant cemeteries. And um, Marion is very in the back of that plot in, in between her two brothers. Here are some other photos that Marion shared with me. So the, the one on the left is her probably taken right after the house was completed. She was probably about 10 or you know, 9 or 10, 1939, 1940. The house looks very similar today. The only thing externally that's changed is that carport 
um, no longer exists. Someone took that down at some point. But otherwise, the house looks very similar. You can see the gardens in the back. That's a rock garden. Um, Marion had a gardener that lived nearby in Enfield. He also moved to Ware and still kept her grounds um, in Ware. And uh, our, our yard does not look like that today. <laughs> but uh, I, she had cutting gardens and uh, you know many uh, beautiful aspects of her yard. And then on the right, there's Mary and Mary together on the, on the porch. Uh, this is to just give you a sense of the similarity between the houses. On the left is Mary and Tryon on the staircase in Enfield, and on the right is the foyer of my house. So you can see that the stairs were removed, and then also just, I know the, the photo on the left is dark, but the trim and the dimensions of the room are, are very similar. So she had certain spaces built to look very similar to her, her father house. Um, on the left, that's Marion at the piano. The pocket doors behind her are in our home, and those have not been painted, which is so nice because they were tucked away. They're in beautiful shape. Um, the pianos are different, but you might notice that the piano benches are the same. But the Tryon still had a lot of Marion's um, books and furniture, and Marion Tryon sadly passed away in 2021. But her husband, her son Mark, was so helpful to me in sharing her papers and photographs, and he also gave me um, the piano bench and a number of books that belong to Mary and Smith, which are now in our house, which is so nice. Okay, so um, around the same time in 2019 that I connected with Mary and Tryon, I started to feel like maybe I had enough material to write a book about Mary and Smith. Um, and I inquired with a local and regional history publisher, and they were definitely interested in books about the quality, but they encouraged me to open it up to other individuals who had been affected by the reservoir. So uh, there were two people who kept coming up in my research about Marion. And the first is this man. His name is Dr. Willard Seeger, and he was the Valley's country doctor. He was a transplant to the Valley, born in Ohio, educated at Princeton and Dartmouth, and he opened his practice in the Valley in 1895. Um, and he was a true country doctor. He traveled by horse and carriage to visit patients all over the Valley in the four towns. Um, he later had one of the first automobiles. He had an office on Main Street and would um, also sometimes accompany patients to the hospital in Springfield by train. Later, he was um, chief resident at Mary Lane Hospital in Ware. <laughs> And he was very active in town. He loved Enfield very much. So he was the chair of the board of selectmen for many years, including at the time the towns were just incorporated. He was on the school board, chief of the Volunteer Firemen's Association, um, the medical examiner, and on and on. And he represented Enfield at Quabbin related hearings, both in the Valley and in Boston. And he presided over the last town meeting in April 1938. And he, um, he planned farewell ball that I'll talk a little bit more about later. <clears throat> the second person that came up in my research quite a bit was Edwin Henry Howe. Um, Edwin was the postmaster and the general store owner, a general store owner, and he also ran a telephone exchange out of his home. Um, he was had deep roots in the valley. He was the sixth generation of Howes um, in Enfield, and there were many branches of the Howe family. And he was um, very active in the, the congregational church as a deacon. Um, he met his wife, Annie, when she, while she was a teacher in town, he was on the school board. And they had three sons who were also very civic-minded. And one of those sons was Donald Howe, who wrote that book, Bob in the Lost Valley, that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so what I didn't realize until after starting to do some more research on these two men were how similar they were uh, to each other and also how similar to Marion in their experience and their views. So like Marion, they both refused to be buried at Quabbin Park Cemetery and purchased plots elsewhere. Doc is buried in Ware and Edmund's buried in Belchertown. They also were among the very last to leave in the summer of 1938. They also moved to Ware. Um, these guys lived, they were neighbors in Enfield, and then they moved to the same street in Ware, just a few houses down from each other. So they kind of kept their community close. And 
they also died within just a few years of leaving Enfield. And sadly for the doc, he was, it was just about six months after. And um, he was probably ill at the time that the towns were being disincorporated. And, um, you know, he, he really kind of carried the towns through that very difficult transition. Um, and then he himself passed not long after that. So this photo was used both in the Boston Globe and the Springfield Republican in, in April 38. Um, so in the first part of the book, I tried to capture a sense of what the towns were like before the reservoir. And um, I used the Centennial, Enfield's Centennial, which took place over Fourth of July weekend in 1916 to, to sort of tell that story. Um, Doc, Edwin, and Marion all helped plan that event, all attended that event. Uh, the, it, was, it was very big and important for the people of Enfield. Um, they, you know, really focused on themes of patriotism, service to country, their Puritan values, and the hope for the future of the community were really what came, uh, what they were trying to get across in this uh, celebration. They had church services, speakers, music, an old home day event, um, and they had a parade that drew over 8,000 people to town, which is pretty remarkable considering they only had about 1,000 people <laughs> who lived there at the time. And what I thought was really interesting is even though the centennial took place 10 years before the acts to pass the Quabbin um, were passed, the people of the valley actually knew even at this time that the reservoir might one day uh, be built. And this is because um, in 1895, there was a report written that advocated for the construction of the Wachusa Reservoir. Um, and that report said, if Wachusa isn't enough water for Boston, and we already know it won't be, at, at some point it won't be, we, the state can always go further west to the Wares with River Valleys, build an even bigger reservoir there, and build an inexpensive conduit between that new reservoir and the existing system. Um, and so this report was publicized pretty widely, you know, in, in the newspapers like the Boston Globe. People uh, in the valley definitely knew um, from then on that someday a reservoir could be built. So in the second part of the book, I talk about Boston's need for water, which was present um, even from its inception in 1630. So you might know that the Puritans had originally selected present-day Charlestown for their settlement but then moved to the Shawmut Peninsula because of the freshwater springs there. Um, and Boston's quest for, for water you know, continued from there. So its first water system delivered water from Jamaica Pond. In 1845, a reservoir was completed. We know today's Kachichua Reservoir that was at Long Pond in Natick. And um, it was a huge day of celebration when this reservoir was completed and the water traveled from Natick to Boston Common. Um, everyone had the day off, there were parades, and um, it was thought that Boston's water problems would be solved for, for quite a while from that moment on. But with the advent of indoor plumbing and the exponential increase in population due to immigration, Boston and many cities needed more water even sooner than they could have so that was the impetus for this 1895 report. So Boston, or the state, was looking for water for Boston again at this time. And they considered a few different sources. Um, they thought about Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire, which would have been complicated um, because of cross state lines. Um, they considered the Merrimack River, but that was notoriously polluted at the time and would have required um, treatment and pumping. Um, and then third option they explored was to impound the south branch of the Nashua River at Clinton Mass, which would become the Wachusett Reservoir. Um, Wachusett doubled Boston's water supply, and the sort of beauty of this plan that was outlined in the report was that um, because of its elevation, it would travel, the water would travel by gravity down to Boston Harbor, so it didn't require pumping. And it also was a, a pretty pure source of water, so it wouldn't require um, filtration, or, or uh, of course it's treated now, but it, it, was, it wasn't going to require um, uh, treatment or filtration. <clears throat> so this is the uh, before and after of Wachusett. So Wachusett was completed in 1905, and 
1,700 people were moved to build Wachusett. So this is something I didn't fully realize when I started this project. Unlike the Quabbin, no whole towns were disincorporated, but a lot of people were moved so that this project could take place. And something I really didn't know about at, when I started my research was that many reservoir projects were happening across the country, and particularly in New England. Um, there's one I focus on in the book, which is one of New York's reservoirs. New York City has a system of 19 reservoirs, mostly upstate New York. Um, and one of them, the Ashokan, was completed in 1917, so right around the time of Enfield Centennial. And it required the removal of over 2,000 people and the, the taking of some towns. And um, so it was a similar project in terms of scale to the Quabbin, although the Quabbin is more larger in terms of acreage um, and size. And these projects, both the Wachusett and then these other projects like the Ashokan, were known to the people of the valley. I mean, these were reported in their local papers in the Springfield and the, in the local area. So by the time, so they both knew that their area had already been targeted as a potential reservoir site. Then they're hearing about all of these projects being completed around them. And so by the time Boston was looking for more water, which was around 1919, I think the people of the valley were pretty resigned to the reservoir happening. At hearings in the 1920s, of course, they expressed their opposition to the reservoir, but it, many of them at these hearings said, um, we, understand, we know this probably needs to happen, and so if it's going to happen, we just ask that you do it as quickly as possible so that we can move on with our lives. But even still, it took years for the decisions to be made. Um, this, the Ware and Swift River Acts were finally passed in 1926 and 1927. <clears throat> so the third part of the book is about that decade from the late 20s to the late 30s when the Quabbin, the towns were destroyed and the reservoir as we know it today was, was built. Um, one of the first things that happened was that the aqueduct from Wachusu to Quabbin was constructed in the, in the late 20s. Um, and then around that time, around 1930, the engineers began arriving in the valley to begin the work, the preparatory work to build the reservoir and also to build the dam and the dike in here in Ultra Town. So um, the engineers, there were many of them. They had an office on Main Street. They, some of them stayed in the valley, renting places from local folks, or they lived nearby in towns like Ware. Um, there, was a, is a sense, was a sense that, you know, the people of the valley were uh, really rejected these engineers, that they were very separate, you know, they didn't sort of intermingle. But there's <coughs> another great Quabbin book that came out a year before mine called Before the Flood by a woman named Beth Rosenberg, and she looked into the engineering records and really focused on this part of Quabbin history and talks about how actually these engineers who moved to the valley became a really important part of the community grew to love the community, <clears throat> led social organizations. Many of these engineers are actually buried in Quabbin Park Cemetery. So, um, you know, a decade of being immersed in this community, they actually <clears throat> formed relationships. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, these engineers who arrived had to mark all the property boundaries and, and map all of the towns. They photographed every structure um, that uh, and piece of property before this purchase and removal. In 1935, things started to feel much more real. Um, there was a railroad that ran north to south through the valley, and it connected the very rural valley with Athol in the north and Springfield in the south. It was very important to the people of the valley. They called it um, by many names, including the Rabbit Run, because it had so many stops. Um, also, the Soapstone Limited, because it went past the Soapstone Quarries up in um, the New Salem area. Uh, the, the, in 1935, they pulled up the, those tracks, which was a, a, a sad moment for the people uh, who lived there. Around that same time, in 1936, people who had relatives buried in the valley started to get letters that asked them to confirm their relation to people who were buried in cemeteries and ask what they wanted to do with those remains. Um, many people said that even more painful than having to leave themselves, was to have to exhume their loved ones who thought that they would, of course, always be buried where they were buried. Um, and in 1937, 
And then in the summer of 1936, thousands of young men, mostly from Boston, um, sort of descended into the valley, and they were the woodcutters. They were there to cut all that brush that would be below the eventual water line. But because they were mostly young city guys and um, they were not experienced with the axe and saw, uh, they made a lot of noise. The people in the valley called them the woodpeckers. <laughs> and uh, they, it, that was a very difficult summer for the people of the valley. They, the, these young guys kind of developed a bad reputation. Many of them lived in Ware. They, um, they got in car accidents. The town of Ware, for example, did what they could to keep these guys busy at night when they weren't working. They had like a baseball league and things like that. And related to this, that same summer of 36, the Enfield Congregational Church was getting ready to celebrate its 150th anniversary. And very sadly, just a week before that was set to take place, the church was burned to the ground. And that's the photo on the right there. Another sort of devastating landmark uh, you know, um, destruction for the people of the valley. And uh, no one was ever charged, but the, the widely held belief was that it was one of those woodpeckers, um, maybe someone who was fired from the project, who had set that fire late one night in the church. <clears throat> so over the course of the next few years, the valley was slowly emptied of its people and buildings. As I mentioned earlier, many there were lots of people who just took their money, they sold to the state, and they left. Others hung around for a few years until they decided where they were going to leave. But in, the, in this time, you know, the valley was slowly emptying. Houses were being destroyed. Um, by 1938, all of the social organizations were disbanded. Uh, by 1938, which is when this photo on the left was taken, um, things were looking pretty dilapidated. You can, I don't know if you can tell, but those buildings on the right you know, are, are half destroyed already. There's a brush fire burning on the left. Um, so this is Enfield's Main Street. And then, finally, in April 1938, Enfield held this farewell ball, and the, and the towns were officially disincorporated. Mm -hmm. So this event is where my book sort of begins. This event really captured my attention and imagination. Um, and I showed you that photo of Marion and Marion, who were the, you know, there together that night. Um, Marion was there along with Doc and Edwin. Thousands of people attended. The hall could really only hold a couple hundred. Uh, they sold tickets to the event, but so many people came that not everybody could get in. And uh, the, so folks were outside of the town hall dancing. There were refreshments available outside. And it was a lot of people who lived in the valley, but, not, but also a lot of people who were just curious. There was a lot of press there that night, and this event was reported even in the New York Times. Um, so Doc planned the event. He led the Grand March, um, and you can see him there in the front of that photo on the right. His wife, Laura, is on his left, and the conductor of the orchestra is on his right. Um, and Doc also held a moment of silence at midnight for the passing of the towns. This was a very emotional moment. And then he had the orchestra quietly play Old Lang Syne. And to describe this moment, Donald Howe uh, wrote this. Muffled sobs could be heard from all parts of the hall, and many hardened men were noted making hurried grasps for their handkerchiefs. Children broke into tears as all realized this was the last gathering of its kind in Enfield, and for that matter, about the last affair of any kind to take place in the community. It's a very emotional night. So I'm just going to sort of wrap up now. Today, as I'm sure many of you know, if you since you live nearby, the Quabbin's a beautiful place to walk and hike and bike um, and enjoy nature. And you can find vestiges of homes and the towns all around the Quabbin. Uh, this example is from Gate 53, which is in Quabbin Park down in Ware. Um, this home was owned by a man named John Powers, and he called it Quaint Quabbin. Um, and now just the foundation is there. You can see how, you know, the, the stone, the base of those stone pillars. Um, and here's another photo taken on the porch and, and what it looks like today. So if you love history, uh, it's a fun place to look around. There are a lot of photos available to kind of compare what it looked like then versus what it looks like now. And of course there's sites that, like Gate 40, which is Dana Common, um, where you can actually see the site of the town. It's in the watershed, but it's above the water line. And so there's um, lots of things to explore like that. 
So I think it's so important to remember that even though the Quad is such a beautiful place to spend time, it's a beauty born of sadness and loss for more than 2,000 people who lost their, their homes. Um, and I also think it's really unfortunate that many of the towns around the Quad, like Ware, um, are really struggling with aging water infrastructure, and our town has uh, not, not a great town water supply. Uh, whereas, the, and the Quabbin is, you know, 10, 10 miles from my house, this beautiful pristine supply that's really benefiting um, Eastern Massachusetts. Uh, so, I'll just thank you all for your time and attention, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. What did the industrialist make in his mill? Uh, oh, uh, Woolen goods, uh, wool, high, a high quality wool for men's suits. I think there were farms up in the hills and stuff like that, right? Yes, yes. And so it was partly, I mean, there were some small industries, but also yes. a lot of farms. Definitely. Did, did you come across anything about where those people went? Because a lot of it was not very good farmland anyway. Right. And the Prescott Peninsula is very rocky and there were a lot of farms up there. That's now a restricted area, but mostly above the waterline. Um, you know, a lot of people went uh, to surrounding towns. Depending on which town you lived in, like it sort of would move you north or south. A lot of Enfield folks went to where in Belchertown. A lot of the folks who were up in the Prescott or Greenwich area maybe went to Orange and Athol. But all around, you know, Brookfield had a, a group of folks who settled there. Um, but yes, you're right, agriculture was a very important part of the valley. Yeah. I think Billy Callahan's father was a farmer. So she came to Amherst. Yeah, and she would have moved back a girl out there. And it's a new sale every year. Yeah. Yeah, and so in New Salem, parts of the town were taken, but you know, obviously a, a, a bunch of it still exists. And even in the research I did about Wachusett, they talked about, uh, the Globe had an article about how folks who lost their homes in the watershed area, many of them just picked up and moved to another part of town. So in that way, the communities were sort of kept together, which is obviously different than these four towns that were I have a question, I just have a comment that I'm sure I guess the audience can share with us. This is so terrific, really. It, it is, the lessons of the historian as a detective and how you go through that as, as well as the power of story. Yeah. And the description and how that really compels us and how important that is to always hold on to. So thank you for modeling that. Thank you so much. Thanks. It's um, you know, I didn't I didn't expect to to do this. <laughs> but it felt it was a very compelling story. Marion's story really um, moved me and um, I feel I, it's very meaningful for me to be able to share it. So thank you. I wonder if you're a daughter Marion. She loves she keeps the book under her pillow. <laughs> Did Doc Seeger keep a diary or a journal or something? That uh, so he I don't know about a diary or a journal, but I have spoken with one of his granddaughters, and um, I believe the family does have his medical books, his, his records. Um, and they, they, I think, have a lot of things that they've kept personally and then others that they've donated, but I believe that they have his books. Cool to see. Yeah. Just another comment. The Jones family, for which the library is named, started out in India. Oh, really? There's a, we'll have to check upstairs. There's a stone from their manufacturing company that's preserved upstairs in special collections. Oh, wow. that's a great connection. The uh, Cummings Construction Company yeah. built the railroad station in Los Angeles. Oh, really? And I worked on converting that into a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And the Cummings family still had the full set of blueprints. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. But that was all filled in. That was like beach sand. It's all mm -hmm. as they raised the. Well, if they only had done it a couple feet more, it wouldn't have as many trucks sitting in there. Oh, right. <laughs> I think they did the bank center. If you go to the bank center, there's a newspaper article about the, and they have their name there. Yeah. They, they as, don't. Sorry. 
H A coming, so H E. H E, yeah. yeah. They built a lot of um, buildings in Ware too, including Mary Lane Hospital, which oh. now sadly had, um, is you know owned by Bay State and is closed. Um, the police station, which used to be the post office, mm -hmm. and a number of other important buildings. Um, I have a question. It seems that the period that this transformation was happening overlies the Great Depression, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if there was any interaction with the kind of effects there. Yeah, so um, one of the things I it, I know was that the project came in under budget, which you know is quite unusual, <laughs> but it was because of the depression and um, the cost of materials and, and wages too, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, the state did their best to compensate people fairly for their home and properties, um, but taking into account the Great Depression and also the fact that Folks had known for so long that their homes might one day be taken, and there's lots of stories of people who, who didn't paint, paint their houses or who kind of let oh. things go. And so by the time the state was evaluating uh, these buildings or their home, the homes um, for their value, you know, it, it was of course much lower than the people who lived there believed. So. On a, a different historical event, shortly thereafter, of course, came World War II, mm -hmm. and part of the club and watershed was used for bombing practice yeah. during the war, mm -hmm. which we think of now as bizarre, but in 1943, it was not covered with trees, it was not, you know, the water was barely coming up, you know, yes. et cetera, and it was open land that they could use to, you know, get ready to go fight. So did they do any archaeological work to look for Native American artifacts? And uh, were there Native American graves in that area that had to be exhumed? Was that even a question they raised? Uh, yeah, right. I don't think it was a question then. There is a lot of um, local uh, sort of folklore and writings about Native American uh, artifacts that were found in prior to the reservoir being built. There were a few folks who lived in the valley who were collectors of various artifacts. There are stories of finding um, Native American graves. It was the Nipmuc people who occupied this uh, part of Massachusetts. Um, so, so there was no formal effort that I am aware of, but um, the name Quabbin comes from the name of the Nipmuc settlement, which it meant the, the meeting of many waters, and it was their settlement at the meeting of the two branches of the Swift River. That site later became um, the site of that field. Was there a hat factory? Yeah, in, in, in Dana. Okay. Yes. A lot of, there's a, a, a few interesting places. Lived in Dana. Yeah. And I remember hat boxes. Yes. Um, in her closets. <laughs> and if you go to the Swift River Valley Historical Society, they have a lot. They have many of the boxes and the hats at the museum. Well, thank you very much.